Okay. So good evening. And first of all, I would like to thank the Anglo-Turkish Society for this opportunity to um, talk with you all and uh, enlighten you all a little bit about the work that I've been done for the past uh, years. Uh, it's been a while since I graduated now in Cardiff. I've, after that, I've worked on the publication of my book, been indeed uh, on national radio uh, and in magazines. It was also a bit coincidental with the 100 year uh, centenary of the Armenian genocide, which for some journalists opened a little bit that bit of the world. So, uh, and I could also uh, talk a bit about my work as well. Uh, tonight, I'm going to uh, talk about my work in three parts. First, I'm going to talk about the historical context, uh, give you a little bit of insight how the Armenians end up in Cilicia, um, talk about the relationship between the Armenian kingdom and the Crusades, and what actually was the importance of that kingdom for medieval hi history and its whole. Uh, following, talk a little bit more in depth about my doctoral thesis and my book. Uh, uh, more about the difficulties uh, scholars have with the, with the identification of medieval castles in the region in general. And I will then go a little bit further on to a model that I've worked on, how you can identify the Armenian castles. Uh, it's a theory that I've worked on. Uh, a combination of different methods that was actually at the core of my research. And as a, a site project, I discovered some new castles in the region, which I will explain and tell you also a bit more about. And to finish, I will tell you more about the Armenian heritage that currently still is in Turkey, and I will uh, explain and show you what I found when I was working in the region and how Turkey is dealing with the heritage. So first of all, we start with a bit of history and a bit of background. To start, as we, as I probably you all are very familiar with the current uh, boundaries and, and uh, of the region, um, but it is quite important to note that the region that we that currently is Chukorova in Turkey, uh, ancient Cilicia, is more than all, it's in between more or less uh, 70,000 kilometers away from uh, what we nowadays see as Armenia, which was at the time, of course, as historic Armenia, as you can see on the map, was a bit larger, but still the migration from that area towards Cilicia was very, was very remarkable. So how did that happen? Um, how did they end up in, in Cilicia? Therefore, we have to go a little bit back in time, even before uh, the medieval period, uh, to the first of all, the foundation of the Armenian kingdom. So you see that uh, when the Armenian kingdom was found in 400, it was also already a conglomeration of different uh, areas together. Um, and was very early on also annexed by the Byzantine Empire neighboring it nearby and maintained actually quite peaceful existence until in the period around 1000, uh, the 11th century, where there was a combination of factors uh, that played in the event of an Armenian migration. One of them was internal unrest in the Armenian kingdom itself. You always had a, a few family uh, baronies that controlled large areas of the kingdom and that held each other a little bit in balance. Well, at that time, the balance was not there anymore, any longer, uh, which was, of course, a very good opportunity for the Byzantine Empire to take control over the area, to play a bit, uh, divide uh, and conquer. Another factor, major factor, is the rise of the Seljuks at the time. So the Seljuks coming from the Eastern, Anatolia, uh, Eastern Asia, march, um, marching on towards the West, find themselves bordering the Byzantine Empire. At the time, it started, of course, with a few occasional raids, 
but a very important uh, battle happened in Manzikert. It's probably a date that you're all quite familiar with in 1071, but that had a huge, you know, what better to, to show you is with uh, maps. So over here we see the large extent of the Byzantine Empire by 1025, after the expansion uh, efforts of uh, the Byzantine Emperor Basil II. Um, so you see it stretches out from the wider Balkan area all the way until the Levant. Uh, but the effect of Manzikert was disastrous for the Byzantines. It basically opened the entire Anatolian open for raids. The Byzantines couldn't maintain their empire anymore. They couldn't maintain their borders. So basically, the entire area was overrun. This caused, must have caused for uh, an effect of the people living there, also in uh, Greater Armenia, in the Kingdom of Armenia, who actually were on, moved all in areas in the Byzantine Empire. It was not only a migration, it was also because as part of the Byzantine policy, a lot of the Armenian uh, barons were taking uh, house in the Byzantine army and were positioned in different areas. So you might have seen as a kind of prelude to the migration that already quite a lot of uh, Armenian officers were located. It be in Cappadocia, it be in the Levant, it be also in Cilicia. But it was in Cilicia that after the fall of Manzik, suddenly they were kind of getting concentrated as you wish. Um, so why Cilicia? Well, I think after having traveled in the region, uh, I've, n I have to be honest to start off. I've never been able to travel yet to Armenia itself, uh, because of the scope of my research was already quite wide and I needed all my funding to visit as much as possible the area of Cilicia and you will very soon in this presentation you will understand why I needed to travel there so much um, but I've of course seen lots of photographs of Greater Armenia but it's very easy to understand that the area of the Taurus Mountains must have looked like very similar to the Caucasian region where uh, the Armenians originated from. Um, why also important and why did they settle there uh, why why did they maintain their strongholds there it's easy the geography um, due to the geography and the fortifications there Armenians managed to hold off the Seljuk advances quite easily from there um, and managed to, to create a few strongholds as you as you wish um, first of all I will give you a bit of geography geog geography uh, inform geographical information before I continue. Uh, as you see, uh, Cilicia is actually surrounded by natural boundaries. You've got the Mediterranean, of course, in the south. You've got the major Taurus mountain range encompassing all the way over here, and actually leading up into the Amanus mountain range, uh, going actually towards uh, northern Syria. And there are only very few passes well, easy accessible passes through these mountain ranges. That is one that is called the Cilician Gates, and uh, the other one is called the Amanus Gates or the Syrian Gates into northern Syria. I think people that are uh, familiar with literature uh, of throughout history, you will have might have came across these names as big armies already uh, passed this this region like the crusade itself uh, of course uh, across this region and actually took uh, made use of these games <coughs> um, the area over here is known as the Cilician plain and it's also famous uh, from antiquity with uh, the cities of Tarsus, Adana and Mamistra uh, and Anna Zarbus is also well known through the Byzantine periods. So it's already, it's a region with a lot of history before the medieval periods. But the Armenians managed to build up their kingdom, but I've told you they arrived there around, uh, at, by the end of the 11th century. The founding of the kingdom 
is actually only official in 1198, uh, so 100 years later. And that 100 years of uh, that, that bit of history is incredibly complex. There are, we've got primary sources that give us a bit, of course, a bit of a, an insight, but it is complex because of the chain, the boundaries changes so quickly. There are, you've got the neighborhoods of different, um, so you've got the Byzantines who are, are still present in and around the area of Cilicia. You've got the Armenians themselves, but you've got the, and I've mentioned them already, you've got the Crusaders who've passed there at the end of the 11th century, and actually who tried at the beginning to keep a little bit of hold of the Cilician plain. And I've given here a map to actually uh, give that a bit of insight. We all are familiar with the Principality of Antioch that was founded by the Crusaders by the end of the 11th century. Well, you see, by the start of the 12th century, it expanded the Normans, uh, because it was a Norman, the Norman Tancreds who founded the Principality of uh, and Bohemond, and then later Tancred, who founded the Principality of Antioch. And you see, they made uh, quite attempts to, to lay their hands or try to lay their hands on the Cilician very fertile plain. It worked, but not, they, they didn't manage to keep control over it due to the Armenian pressure and also the Byzantine pressure. Now, well, important to know for this 12th century is that within the Armenians that were settled in Cilicia, you can attribute two big clans of families. One is the Rubinid clan, and one is the Hetumid clan. Now, the Rubinid clan was from the start. They tried to put quite an independent course loose from uh, the Byzantines, who they actually, like I told you before, they all were all once officers in the uh, Byzantine army. But the Rubinid clan straight away saw this opportunity of this uh, vacuum, as you as you may, as you may while the Hetmans remained, tried to remain loyal to the Byzantines. Probably this is a kind of consideration, like if, I, if we remain loyal towards uh, Constantinople, we might be rewarded with having the whole province of Cilicia. That must have been the considerations uh, that were made at the time, while the Rupinids thought uh, this is maybe a more moment to actually claim this land. So throughout the 12th century, You've got that that game wish uh, between all these powers in the region. In the region, now I told you the kingdom of Armenia of Armenian Cilicia is important for our knowledge of the medieval history, but also for our knowledge of the Crusades, and it should help fight the perception of the Crusades solely as a fight between the West and the East. The 12th century in Cilicia proves none so ever. There were uh, alliances were made uh, either between Armenians and Crusaders, but also when I just showed you with the uh, expansion of the Normans of Antioch, there was rivalry between them. Uh, but you've got also the Byzantines who were still there and also the Seljuks. So you've got that throughout that century. Um, yeah, they align. I, I always mention actually in my talks that people like to watch the fiction uh, series uh, Game of Thrones and find it all very exciting. Well, I, I always recommend reading a few chronicles of the, during the 12th century uh, and you will see that intrigue and everything, it's all, it's, it's all there to make some very good stories. Following the end of the 12th century, you as uh, you probably already guessed, it was the Rupinid clan who at the end took control, took, won the power struggle with the Hittimids. So by the end of the uh, 12th century, they managed, due to also situations of the Byzantine Empire not being so much in control anymore, and more importantly, having support of the Holy Roman Emperors, who actually gave his permission or granted, uh, and he sent his uh, advisor to to join the coronation of Levon I as the first Armenian king of Cilicia. 
And that is quite important uh, because it gave a little bit of Western support towards the founding of that kingdom. And it also stopped for the time being the Byzantine pressure on the Armenians. So the Armenians could establish themselves next to the Principality of Antioch, the county of Edessa, which lasted not very long after, uh, uh, who actually was already gone by the time, <laughs> just uh, mentioning that. Um, but they meant they were still uh, like in between others because the Celtics were still there. And a little bit later, by the uh, end of the 13th century, also the Mamluks uh, came as well as the Mongols. So you've got the, in this very, very small piece of land, you've got a lot of different influences. So it's very interesting when you study architecture to see the influences coming from every direction and from other cultures. So that was very uh, interesting. Why is it also important? Well, if we know that the Western Crusader states, uh, the last one, the last stronghold, fed, Fall, the fall of Acre uh, fell in 1293. Well, the Armenian kingdom managed to survive for almost another 100 years. So you ask yourself, they were definitely massively outnumbered. So how could they manage to maintain that kingdom in some, in what so that the Crusaders were not managing or not being able to do with more manpower? Well, at least more manpower in comparison with the Armenians. Well, the reason is actually mainly to my work, which is not the fortifications. But at first they had a little bit of help, at least, of the military orders. So I'll first zoom a little bit more in, in, the, history or in the history of the kingdom itself, with uh, a focus on the presence of the crusaders there. It's important to know, and I've tried to make that clear, before... 1198, there was no support of the military orders. You only had the neighboring uh, principality of Antioch, that was it. Uh, and you had Templars who were already located in the north of the principality, but also the relationship between the Rubenids and the Templars was not very uh, amical, I would say. So the relationships at the beginning was actually not uh, existent. It's changed, as I told you, with the uh, founding of the kingdom and that was everything to do with the role of the king Levon the first himself and he saw a little bit the benefit of not only having the holy roman emperor uh, like oversee his coronation but made basically made deals to exchange lands uh, fortifications and lands uh, 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 take back alongside it towards uh, the military orders and in return, the military orders not only administered these lands for their own benefit, but uh, gave protection. And it will become more clear when I show you where they were located. So you have the Knights Hospitaller who were established in the southwest, as you wish, as you wish who were actually uh, making sure that the Seljuks of the area of Karaman were actually basically uh, took a bit of control over the, over the security there. Then you had the Knights, the Teutonic Order, which were granted lands towards the east, who actually also took a little bit of the defense of the Amanus uh, gates over here. And then you have, as I mentioned, the Knights Templar, who were located mostly at the north of the Principality of Antioch. And they were never really granted these castles. There was always a little bit of tension between the Armenians and the Knights Templars for the possession of these fortifications. And I'll show you straight away with an example. One example is Chalan Kalesi of La Roche de Rossel, uh, as, you, as we may attribute it from the sources, which actually is located quite deep in the Amanus Mountains and overseeing uh, a pass, uh, a very small pass through the mountains. Um, we see some Knight Templar influence in the, in the build and the repairs of the castle uh, that are different from the Armenians, but I will tell you more about that later. And one famous castle that you might have already known of if you've come across some Crusader uh, studies is the Castle of Bahras which is quite important in uh, 
several periods throughout the Crusades. And also with the First Crusade, with the uh, siege of Antioch as well before then. After that, the Teutonic Knights. Well, it's quite easy to uh, identify, not only from the sources, we know that the castle of Amuda was uh, being granted uh, to the Teutonic Order and was actually a fortress built there by the Teutonic Order because the rectangular square keep is almost unique in the whole Cilicia. The building, even the building material is different from any others uh, and the style, as I said, as well. So you can clearly see the crusader influence there in uh, the military fortifications there. But you see that they were granted uh, long lands towards the east of the of the Cilician plain. These uh, were very fertile lands. So there was a high price the king of the Armenian king had to pay. He had to grant the military orders very good lands in order to get that kind of safety of protection towards the border of the kingdom. And last, we have the Knights of Spitler, which uh, were concentrated in the southwest of the kingdom. Most importantly is the, is the castle of Silivke or um, Seleukia. Um, the Kalikatnus River is quite famous as during the Third Crusade, it was uh, where King uh, well, Emperor um, Frederick I of Barbarossa was drowned or got a heart attack while bathing on his way towards the Holy Land. So, and that place is just nearby the fortification of Seleucia. In that fortification as well, there were major uh, repairs done by the Knights of Spitler. And also here, the architect architecture is different from uh, castles we found elsewhere in the region. That leads us towards the main bulk of the, the castles, the Armenian castles. So, with my uh, PhD, which was focused on, okay, what is now the Armenian contribution towards the military architecture in the Middle Ages? Well, if you, because if you read a lot of primary sources, uh, Western primary sources about the Crusades, you come across the, the role and the influence of a lot of Armenian architects. So Armenians were hired a lot by the Crusaders in the building of their uh, fortifications. So it's quite important to see what, what borrowed the Crusaders in their building of castles from the Armenians and what could we see was already happening in, in, in Cilicia itself. What was the uh, improvements the Armenians made towards the buildings, the fortifications that are already there? Uh, for example, from the Pioneer inheritance. So it's all of this information should help us to build a bit more the historical landscape of the of the area, um, but that is not easy because it's very hard to uh, identify an Armenian building style. And I will tell you a little bit more how I tried that during my work. So first of all, I will give you an uh, insight in, and I told you that I travel. I had to travel a lot to the to the region. For my research, I studied 124 castles in the region of Cilicia, and that was not every that was not every medieval fortification in the area. I have to uh, limit myself a little bit at some uh, places to make it also manageable. Uh, and on the right, you see an example of all the castles that were actually the Armenians. At one stage during the medieval periods, uh, were in control of or did some kind of repairs to. And you see straight away that actually Armenian kingdom stretched at one point a little bit larger than the area of Cilicia. You see they were uh, actually close on the west towards places just as such as Ali Aliana, close to Antalya. Uh, you have here, over here, you have the place of Anamur. Um, Marmuri Kalesi in Turkish. So it stretched out throughout the whole uh, wide region. So I had to make a little bit of, make it uh, easy for, well, not easy, but make it workable for my research. Uh, 
And as I mentioned, the Armenians, when they arrived in the area, they managed to survive there for a long time, also because they made use of the castles that were already built there. Um, a good example is the fortress of uh, Azgit, uh, which is um, most likely an, an early, uh, late Byzantine fortress which, um, with some Armenian repairs as well. There are some characteristic Byzantine touches such as this cross here uh, above the uh, postern by the back. Um, but when I told you the Armenians moved towards uh, Cilicia, well, for the past three centuries before their arrival, the area of Cilicia was actually the frontier between and Arabs. And the frontier was the Taurus Mountains because it was very hard for any army to travel across the Taurus logistic wise. You had to prepare yourself very well to, to actually make a proper invasion through the, the mountains. And as a, from a defensive point of view, it's very easy to maintain a frontier alongside this, uh, this, geograph this, uh, this topography, because you only need to control a few of the very important uh, mountain passes and you can control your, front your, your frontier quite well. So, and we are aware from the Byzantine sources as well, that there was a kind of guerrilla warfare tactic coming from these little garrison fortresses in the region, trying to, um, to make raids in the fertile Cilician plain, then return with their booty. There are several mention also even in Arab sources about this kind of warfare that, that carried on for uh, almost 300 years. So, but that, that made it for the Armenians quite not easy, but they made full use of the fortifications they already found there. That makes it very interesting, but also very difficult as a scholar in the region, because you need to familiarize yourself also with the Byzantine fortifications as well. I mentioned, of course, afterwards, after the Byzantine period, you have the the, the um, uh, the, the Armenians uh, arrived in the area and they had two uh, strongholds, either the Rubinids, either the Hetimids. And just to give you an example of the major stronghold of the Rubinids, this is the castle of Faha or Feki Kalesi. And the scale of this fortress is, of course, already of a different scale than uh, any of the Byzantine fortresses. This was a, a stronghold, a place where which was very important, which was not which was not only uh, from military point of view but also administrative. This was a, a, a huge place that, of course, grew to be more important throughout the beginning of the Armenian history in Cilicia. But the capital moved throughout the 12th century when the when the kingdom was properly found. The capital moved towards Cis, which is located in the north of the Cilician Plain. But the, the, scale, the different scale of fortifications to be found in Cilicia. A different example, for instance, are many of the state houses that are be found in the region. I've tried to give two different examples of that. Uh, on the left, you see Kislar Kalesi, which is located in the plain, as is Sinap, which is also located in the plain. You see, definitely, Sinap, it's very original in its form and in its um, architecture use. Of this type of uh, estate house, like in Sinap, there are four, four actually similar models uh, in the region. So they must have, um, uh, most likely, they must have been uh, having served as a kind of administrative purpose. Uh, for a local baron who administered his lands from there. Um, and of course, there are also major, major strongholds. And one example of that is um, Yilan Kalesi, which is one of the best, very well preserved Armenian fortresses in the Cilician Plain. Uh, it has multiple baileys, which I will tell you a little bit later for. And as you might have already mentioned, I keep using uh, Turkish names. Well, I've learned a little bit of Turkish uh, by the end of my trip as well. And the first 
I visited Tilan in my first trip, so I by then I didn't speak only a few words of Turkish, but it was uh, some farmers who uh, made me well aware of what the word Yilan actually meant. And he, there was one farmer that kept on uh, pointing at his hands, which was actually double the size of mine, but he was uh, bitten, been bitten by uh, a Yilan or a snake. So Yilan Kalesi is nothing less than a Turkish attribu attribution for the castle of the snakes which there is no references, there are no reference of in medieval literature about a cast, like a castle of the snakes. These were just toponyms given by uh, Ottomans or Turks much later towards these places without knowing uh, their history. To continue, I'll just coffee as a little break. So, I think by this point you might have already uh, understood that this is a hell of a job to try to distinguish all these different building styles and because you have you have to do with Byzantine influences, you have to do also now and then with a few Arab um, uh, in the Cilician plain most likely where the frontier was uh, was held was held. Uh, Arab presence, you've got of course the Armenians, but you've got the Crusader uh, presence for a little period and very at the end by the 13th century you've got the Mamluk presence and much later the whole area was dominated by the Ottomans who on some places on the coastline also did some repairs. So you've got all these different layers in the, in the building and the repairs of fortification that makes it very hard to, to attribute what, which uh, culture actually build what. In most cases, archaeologists can use technology, just as, such as dendrochronology is one. Well, sadly, in the area, uh, in the region, there was hardly any use of wood, or there is nothing almost uh, that is actually preserved. So that was also not an option for me to use. To give you also an idea, um, there were only inscriptions to be found on ten of the sites. Armenian inscriptions, that is. So that gives us a little bit of information on some on some castles, and from there, that's a good starting point. But it's also not a major thing to to start from. And not to mention that on all these sites, no archaeological excavation has taken place so far. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give a little bit more insight in my last part when I talk about the the actual heritage. That is, that is there and how the Turkish government is dealing with it. But it is quite important if you know the fortifications of Syria of Israel, of, uh, and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, uh, the Principality of Tripoli, Antioch, how much, well, how many excavations have taken place there. If you compare it with the huge number of sites in Cilicia and with actually hardly or no ar proper archaeological record, that really makes it very hard to start off with. But nonetheless, that was the starting position when I started my work. And I've tried at least to uh, make a few things clear. To uh, a good example of how difficult it is, is this site of Toprak Kale, the Turkish uh, toponym of the site, which is uh, known in Latin sources as Castrumilis uh, Nigrum or also known from Arab sources as Tilhamtun, but I wanted to use the site as um, what I've seen from scholars in the past 50 years, people who wanted to, and it was mostly crusader scholars, who wanted to also take this region a little bit as a bit of their, how would I say, they didn't, they were not fully interested in the, in the area because they had also their interest in the other crusader uh, areas, but they, because they are, they come across quite frequent in Crusader sources. So they really want to also know which castle it is that the sources are referring to. There's always been that kind of game, like trying to attribute as much places from the sources on castles. But this is a very uh, hard game because I've told you there are so many fortresses and we know only so limited amount uh, of information from the primary sources. So. This is really not a, a very good starting point to, to, to do this kind of uh, analysis. 
So how did I start it, my work? Well, I did start with inscriptions uh, because some inscriptions give a little bit more information, not only from the time there's a repair or there was something, it gives us a little bit of a time frame that something happened with the castle. Put that together with some of the primary sources which tell us when uh, some of the major castles that we can attribute were actually uh, taken in control of, of the Armenians. That gives us a first step. Most, but most importantly, there are with a lot, a huge number of the castles, there is, an, there is an, a very high degree in, cons in consistency of uh, the characters, uh, of characteristics that were uh, used for the fortifications. And most of all, if you do a very good mortar and masonry analysis, you will find that there is a, spe a specific type that comes back time and time again. If you put all of that information together, you can actually see that there was a period where the Armenian kingdom was at its strongest. That is the period 1200. And if you want to stretch it, you can stretch it to 1300. But I would say, oh, let's say 1275, where there was where the Armenians were managing to keep actually their external enemies at bay. At that time, you see that a similar type of masonry was used in the wider area of Armenia. So that means that you can not only see many of the repairs were made on castles that were actually similar with the construction of castles built out of nothing. So you can start to make a little bit of an, uh, a theory like, okay, this type of masonry, this type of mortar, this is must all come out of that small period of 70 years, uh, let's say 100 years, that they were built in the Armenian period. So these are inscriptions that are to be found. That one is on Yilam Kalesi. It depicts uh, a ruler in the middle, um, which you can see on the left, there is still a lion visible over here, the lion which is a symbol of the Rupinate in later Armenian Kingdom. This must have been the same symbol over here, but it's not very visible any longer. This type of archway, by the way, while I was talking about uh, characteristics, this is an exact type of, of archway that is can be found in 25 other fortifications and is never to be found in any of the fortifications that are that we can attribute with other uh, cultures such as Byzantines or Crusaders or whatsoever. So very specific Armenian. Another example of what actually we can uh, use of, uh, make use of inscriptions. The right on the bottom right, you see here an Armenian inscription, which actually tells us in detail that the, not, the not the stronghold was built by the Armenians, but that this tower was repaired by Levon in 1187, and Levon would be the later first king of Armenia. Now, this is remarkable, this tower. Why? Together with the tower I showed you earlier of Amuda, which was from the Teutonic Order, this is the, together with that, this is the only rectangular tower to be found in the whole area of Cilicia. Now, again, if you compare that with the other areas nearby where you found the rectangular tower, way more frequent. This is quite unique. That allows us also to, uh, we know that Amavarsa was taken into control by the Normans, like I told you at the beginning of the presentation, in the beginning of the 11th century, when the Normans were trying to keep control over the uh, Cilician plain, where Amavarsa is located. Well, it is highly likely that this is one of the earliest crusaders uh, um, building evidence in the uh, Near East that we know of. Um, so the, sh the shape is completely different from anything that is Armenian. Um, and, um, and the inscription uh, helps us also to give a bit more insight in what happened then uh, later. To go further with the inscriptions, we have here an inscription uh, in the very well-pictured uh, castle of Kiskalesi, 
which is Turkish for Maiden Castle, another uh, Turkish invented myth that has nothing to do with the actual history. Um, but this inscription tells us about repairs that were done by the Lusignan, so much later uh, influence of Cyprus in uh, the Kingdom of Armenian Cilicia. And the repairs were done on these top of these towers. So again, it, and you, when you study the towers, you see the different layers of uh, repairs that were built. And this inscription actually gives a, a very good time frame from when the last repairs were done on this castle. Uh, another last is the Chapel of Toros, which dates to the start of the 12th century and gives us, uh, it's, the inscription shows us that um, the castle was, uh, the, the chapel was dedicated towards the, by then, Rubinet uh, Baron, but not king, king yet, because we're talking about early 12th century, uh, towards Toros. The chapel is located, so this is the site of Angavarza. You see it is absolutely massive. The keep that I told you earlier about, the Norman uh, keep, is located here in the center. And the chapel is, uh, is actually in the first part over here. You've got here a first um, bailey over here. You've got here then the central keep. And then you've got a much later second bailey that was added later in the medieval time. Um, this image shows you as well how much we can start relying on satellite imagery uh, for, arche for archaeology because over here you see quite well the surroundings of the classical city of Anazarbus. And here see the uh, outside wall. You can still even here see the main route through what must have been the classical town. And there are still lots of classical sites actually dotted throughout this area. This uh, classical site has been uh, excavated. Um, but the medieval Acropolis, if you may, has never been excavated so far. To give you also an idea of how large the site is, it takes you from the start of the hill over here, it takes you up to two hours and a half to reach the top northern end of the site over here. So it is quite big. Okay, that leads us to the next, uh, the characteristics of Armenian fortifications. So throughout my work, I've made a set list of things that you can uh, rely on when you uh, work with medieval fortifications in the area that you pick up. If you put all these characteristics next to each other, the chance is very highly likely that they are Armenian. Um, they, Armenian castles make excellent use of the topography, hills, ridges, cliffs. They all use it to their best advantage. And then if there is such thing as an easiest way up, it's always the best protected way by the presence of towers. A good example of how they use the topography, this is the castle of Bodrum Kalesi, which lies on an outcrop. You must try to imagine how much man effort this must have taken the Armenians to build this castle. The average temperature in the Cilician Plain, by the way, is more or less 37, 38 degrees Celsius. So I hope for them that they built as much as possible in the cooler winter periods. Another example which I already mentioned is the use of multiple baileys. Now, well, this is something that the Crusader architecture later, much later, also introduced in their building of fortifications. Um, these sites are, for my, in my opinion, the best examples of it. The left one is Yilan Kalesi, where you stand actually in the middle of the fortress, looking down on two baileys. You see here at the bottom, a first curtain wall with a little bailey over here, and then uh, you've got actually a central bit. Now you have even another part on the other side from where the picture was taken. So to give you an idea that they really tried to make to make best use of the terrain. Anavarza, as I told you earlier, you've got three different sections, a southern bailey here, 
you've got the central Norman keep with a middle, and then you've got the northern bit uh, complete at the left hand side. So these are vast fortifications as well. Uh, the use of the round towers of the horseshoe shaped towers, they are almost certainly an Armenian contribution towards uh, the medieval military architecture. Why is this quite uh, certain? Because we found, uh, I have, while I've not visited Greater Armenia, I have done some research towards the fortifications that to be found over there. And while I thought there was hardly any research done on Armenian fortifications in Cilicia, this virtually done on fortifications in Greater Armenia, but the few photographs I found and a few studies that I saw, uh, mainly from actually Russian uh, specialists, as Armenia was in the Cold War period, uh, part of uh, the Soviet Union. Um, I found one uh, study, and this, while I couldn't speak Russian, he, the accumulation of photos was very interesting. And you actually already see this kind of round towers already also in fortification that the uh, scholars were actually dating towards the early medieval period. So it must be very likely that the Armenian architects brought this and actually perfectionized this theory in the area of Cilicia and then later was uh, copied by uh, the Crusaders as well by the use of Armenian architects uh, in whole. And these are only a few of a uh, hundred photos I got from round towers. So the relevance of uh, my work, well, it was quite pioneering work. Uh, and there was uh, before me only a handful of scholars who actually dared to work in the area. Uh, most uh, relevant, I think, which uh, got a bit of news attention is the, that I made some new discoveries uh, with my research in the area. And I did that due to a combination of actually social media and archaeology. And I'll explain that a little bit more. It's got everything to do like it was, I have to tell you a story of a trip I was doing. Um, I have actually, I had the luck at the time. Uh, my now wife was actually the illustrator of my PhD research. So she was uh, my travel companion at the time. So we spent a few years traveling in the area and it was on one of those travels that we were driving through the plane on, uh, with a uh, fortification in mind to go to visit that we came across these ruins uh, of which you see the picture on the left. And I, ha I had a lot of uh, maps always in the car because this was a little bit before the, the really digital uh, time. Uh, so I still had a lot of old fashioned maps with me in the car um, because the, my sat nav at the time I only showed like green fields that I was driving through because it didn't really detect the roads. But I came across this and I was very sure that my through my 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 information I had, we were not we were not going about to pass a fortification at this point. So I recorded all the, the coordinates. I took lots of uh, notes, photographs, a few measurements, and I couldn't find it on any map whatsoever. So I thought, this is very odd. Like I've just found something just by driving through, through the area that is not identified, that is uh, never mentioned in the studies of the, the few scholars there. Uh, so I thought, if, what is the chance if I can just find these places by just driving through? There, must be, there might be a way of trying to actually see if there are any more of these castles. On the right, you see satellite imagery of the area. So yeah, if, you tr if you've traveled there and then you've got the coordinates, yes, you can find, you can see some kind of structure on the satellite imagery, but it would have taken me probably more than my lifetime to find the castles these way, this way. So I thought, okay, might, there might be another way. And that's where the social media comes in. 
And that was actually um, a site called uh, Panoramio. I don't know if any one of you uh, actually are familiar with or, or, or have ever heard of the name Panoramio. Well, it's actually not non-existent anymore. It was closed in 2016 by Google. Uh, but what did it do? Uh, so it was actually a kind of uh, a social platform where people could um, uh, link up the photos they took with their smartphone on an online platform. So every photo we take leaves a trace, a geological tra uh, 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 it gives us data from where the, the photo was actually taken. So the, and there was a lot of, because the panorama was at the time also linked with Google Earth. So you could see these pictures also on Google Earth. So when people were taking pictures and loaded them online on the platform, you would have like a thousand pictures spread all over the area. So what I, what I did do in a few uh, weeks time, I went through all the pictures of the, of the Taurus mountains. And what I came across was a lot of like holiday photos of Turkish people just taking photos of their kids uh, in the in the background, within the background, the castle where they just live a, a few houses from. So I started to look for when I saw these holiday photos with their location. I tried to match them with actually the maps of which we are known where the castles are, and see if I could like find uh, any new uh, places that we don't know uh, that we didn't know the existence of. Afterwards, I always did uh, also a satellite imagery check if I could see that there was a structure in the in the vicinity. Then I put it on my list, and when we went in the region, we did a few field surveys to actually see if the photos match actually what's there in real real time. And I give you a few insights of, like for instance, the photos that I came across. On the left, you see uh, a castle, a little castle that is uh, in the town of Hibili. Some kids are posing in front of the castle. But of course, the holiday snapshots could vary from people jumping on castles or just people presenting themselves in a castle. So, but these were, these three examples, these are three examples of castles that were not identified before and that I managed afterwards to actually locate, identify, map. And they were all Armenian in, uh, in they all had traces of Armenian construction. Um, but of course, it's good that they are also now identified and mapped. And this is an example of the satellite imagery that there is, I have to tell you, there is a big uh, evolution in the technology of satellite imagery. This is a, f a photo. This is imagery from 2005, as it says, it says here. Well, if I've, I've done in the last few years, I've done a bit of a new check on the satellite imagery and it's improved so much since. But you can clearly see over here, if you know that there is a castle, you can clearly see the circuit wall all around the outcrop of the fort, of the top of the rock. So the res uh, result of this little side project that I did that uh, were 80 new castles that I identified. The fortifications, as you've seen already, a few examples, they vary in the state of preservation and in size. The only downside for the scholar is that they, most of them were located deep inside the Taurus Mountains. So that means that you really have to track very deep into, which is not, not always easy accessible. Um, and they are, yeah, very hard to uh, to actually then also uh, approach as you see in the picture on the left. Just to make you aware, I've only managed to do one fifth of a uh, survey of, of the whole of Cilicia and mainly because as you saw it in the earlier slides, uh, Panoramio ceased to exist in 2016. So at 2000, when I finished my PhD in 2013, I thought, oh, this is a nice project that I can work on for the, the years to come. But uh, Panorami are closed without actually me knowing it. So uh, away with all the access to all that material. So it's a gigantic opportunity for future scholars to work in the area. 
but there are a few dangers that I always try to tell, warn people about before they jump very enthusiastically in the field. The first of them is snakes that you come across in the area of Yilam, that you come in the area a lot. Most places are very isolated. The first time I traveled the area, I was very naive. I only had uh, my card, my sat nav measurements. Uh, and I came across this uh, copy of the snake, luckily dead. But that, then, it re then I realized, because at the time, mobile phone reception was also non-existent in that area. So uh, it made me well aware that you have to take some precautions. But I talk about three S's. There are also scorpions in the area and lovely examples of spiders. But there's also other dangers when you travel in the area. That is, uh, the roads are not always very accessible. So you have to travel a lot with, uh, on very unpaved roads. And I put this photo in because actually this is a quite a funny story. This is the picture. Uh, I've only had one car problem. This is the problem I had on the last castle I've ever I've visited. Uh, for my work and something like Murphy's Law, they say like, of course, on the last uh, climb, um, I heard a noise that was not very good. And I looked out of my wing mirror and I saw part of my tire lying a few yards behind me. So uh, I had to uh, put an emergency, emergency tire on with the help of very friendly local Turkish people who were just passing by to gather their uh, crops. <laughs> so that gives you a bit of light into uh, my work that I've done in the area. Let's tell me, tell you a little bit more now about the uh, Armenian heritage now, how the Turkish government is dealing with it. First of all, I will tell a little side story with on my uh, trip in 2013, I visited the last Armenian village uh, in Turkey today, which is Fakifli and is located in the southeast of the Cilicia area, but actually very closely lo located, as you see on the map, close to Antakya uh, or uh, classical Antioch. Um, so I was first very amazed when I heard that there was still an Armenian uh, village in, uh, in Cilicia. And then I visited the place and the people living there told me the story of that when the Armenian genocide took place in uh, the period 1915-1917, the local Armenian villagers uh, uh, resisted the, uh, the Ottoman advances for 53 days, but they were actually rescued by a French uh, uh, boat that was actually uh, doing a bit of, uh, um, like uh, they were controlling the Gulf of Alexandretta, which is actually located over here. And they saw the a signal that the, uh, the, the Armenians made, namely Christians in distress help us rescue. So the Armenians were evacuated from there, but years after, when also uh, the situation in Turkey was uh, stabilized again as well, they, those were the only people that decided to return to the place where they came from. So they actually returned after the Second World War and actually lived ever since. Uh, they lived very peaceful, peaceful and in good harmony with, their, with the neighboring villages. Uh, no support from Ankara, but they were very welcoming and were very uh, interested to hear my work, which actually they were not very familiar with. They knew there was an Armenian kingdom there, but they didn't grasp the extent, the amount of uh, heritage that is still there. They couldn't comprehend that really. So they were very uh, happy to hear that some work was done towards that heritage. And that leads me towards one of the, re I've told you there are a few uh, difficulties for researchers in the area, but those are only natural ones. Um, there are of course also political ones, while it is very hard to 
receive any kind of permit of the Turkish government to do any work on these uh, fortifications. But there was one uh, exception. That was actually the groundbreaking pioneer in archaeology and the, and the medieval archaeology in the area, and that is W. Edwards. He's now an American archaeologist who didn't really graduate uh, from any university, so I thought that was quite interesting uh, at first. And the more I was, got, was getting myself familiar with his work, the more I thought, damn, his drawings are very good for someone who didn't study archaeology, who hasn't got any kind of uh, univers university background or so. Um, and it was only when I was starting to meet people at conferences and actually who still knew him by the time he was a scholar that I received a bit more background information on him. Like it was mostly after in the late hours of uh, after conferences in the pub when people were suddenly becoming more candid and open about certain things. Um, and so I have to tell you that Roberts did his work in between the period 1970, 1980. He published in 1986. In 1992, he does one more publication. He was uh, located in the Barton Oaks in Washington. And after that, he completely disappears from the, from the radar. No publications, no track anymore, no track also online. I did my best then to find any track of him to try to meet him and, and get insight in all the work that he's done. Because like I said, he traveled for more than uh, seven years in the region on horseback. And then I started to put puzzle pieces together. You've got this area, this period, 1970, 1980, which is a Cold War period with Turkey as being a very important uh, country for the Americans in that, at that time. And someone who is allowed to travel in the area, which I've shown you the, the map with the geographical boundaries. It is an area that you can travel from one country to the other very easily because it is so vast. And you've got natural boundaries, which it's impossible to monitor, to control every point. So, of course, wouldn't it be an ideal uh, kind of job for a CIA agent and undercover for, um, as an archaeologist, to do some work, archaeological drawing, and by at the same time do some mapping of military installations? It was something that uh, a, an ex-colleague of him told me at a conference that that was actually his background and that he, he was allowed by the Turkish government to work in the area on one condition, he could not publish. He did publish and he disappeared from the radar. Maybe the Americans gave him a new uh, identity or so to keep him safe. Uh, these are just a few theories, but it's very intriguing nonetheless. Um, so the Armenian heritage that's to be found in is from crucial importance that the sites that I've just mentioned are preserved, definitely for our knowledge of medieval architecture, but also because, and this is where it becomes, this, it's also timely because by the time I was working there, I could see that the Turkish government were trying to do construction works in the area, major roads, um, and there was also an expansion of the population in the Taurus Mountains as well, trying to make, because the area of the Silesian Plain is so warm in the summer, a lot of people who live there actually tried to make build their kind of a summer place, house, so that they can stay higher up in the mountains. So that makes a bit of the... Um, we, I saw at several sites that some of the building material of of uh, fortifications was already used for some of the buildings that were made by people. So there is a bit of a, a time aspect there that these sites need to be protected. Uh, the renovation works of the government is another one, but on, on another scale. And this was, I have to tell you, this was before the outbreak of the Syrian war. Um, Turkey at the time decided that this area might have some potential as the next kind of holiday resorts next to the Izmir, Bodrum, Antalya. They wanted to uh, also uh, maybe exploit this area touristically. 
So you did see on some sites on the coast that they were trying to do some repairs. And I call this a little bit the Hollywood, making the Hollywood version of fortifications, like trying to patch uh, with a few modern bricks so that people have the uh, impression that they uh, not only enter a ruin, but a proper castle. And this is of course quite dangerous because repairs of this kind without proper survey work could actually really destroy a lot of information. And I'll give you a bit of insights of what happened. This is a good example from 1975. This castle, Kum Kalesi, doesn't exist any longer because it had to make place for uh, a big lake the Turkish government created for uh, electricity. So, of course, benefit of the people, but this site was only uh, not very well uh, documented. So it is quite sad that this is not, that this does no longer exist. And this is how, when I told you that the Turkish government wanted to promote this area now a bit as the new uh, holiday resort area. This is a flyer uh, we, I came across while working in the region. I was living in London at the time and I was taking the underground to go from the British Library, my workplace, back home. And I came across to this advert in the underground and I was there like, shit. This is one of my castles that I work about. So I was massively shocked to see this. Uh, and then I did some research and it came out that they really wanted to attract people to the area. And you can say, okay, this is a valid, of course, a valid, valid policy. But then you ask yourself, of course, what is the government doing in order to try to preserve these castles? Well, I told you about the Hollywood's uh, ification of the castles. In Kiskalese, you have a good example of on this bit of the fortification where you see that newly built blocks were put over here to make it the circuit wall complete. The only other thing that they do on any fortification in the, in the area is put a Turkish flag on it. Now, Turkish flag on itself, it doesn't do much harm. Uh, it's got, of course, nothing to do with Turkey uh, history-wise, but that doesn't do much harm. What does more harm is to my point is education and knowledge and that is the information that they give next to the castles so this is the plate that has been mined on the sea castle that i just presented of Kiskalesi. let me just come back and show you so on this sea castle this is the information and it gives information of the ancient site of Korikos, which is actually the land bits of Korikos was a, a and a classical and medieval harbor. So on the sea castle, which is may only a medieval attribution, they put information about the bits on the land that are classical. There's no mention about, there's a bit mentioned about that there are Byzantine churches, which are the medieval to be found in the area of Korikos. But after uh, 600 AD, no more information. So this is one site. This is their major touristic exploit. Another example is the sea castle of Aya, Ayas. Now, I, you, some of you might be familiar with the name Ayas, as this is one of the, this is the place where Marco Polo on his travels uh, went to land. So it's got, it's got some, some history behind it as well. Well, this is more, uh, to my point, um, irritating because this, clearly mentions the medieval periods and gives information about the name. It mentions the Byzantine occupation of the site, but it doesn't, it mentioned the Mamluk attacks on the site, but it does not mention any form of Armenian occupation on the site. So this is where as a, as a government, if you want to uh, like, yeah, um, exploit these sites, that some proper information is definitely on its place. Now, there are exceptions. They are rare, but there is one that I found. And not to say the least, because it's, it was a sign that was placed by the city council, the local city council itself, without knowledge of Ankara. I've talked with the people over there about it because I was so 
uh, amazed to read about a proper information sign. And they said, like, so Kozan of Sis was the capital of the Armenian kingdom. Um, so it was important. And when you walk around in the city, you find medieval traces, Armenian traces. They are not only Armenian, you find even Venetian trade houses. The influence, the medieval influence is everywhere. But it's then very nice to see that these people are embracing their history and trying to give it its proper place in history. Um, to say the most people of Kozan were also of a Kurdish uh, descent, which also maybe explains, as you are probably quite familiar with the Kurdish relation with Ankara. So, but they were definitely very open about it. And they had actually big plans to make a big restoration project of the site. Um, sadly enough, as you see, the restoration work was given a start in 2013. I went towards the coordinator, uh, the project leader of the project, who was based in Istanbul. Well, he went off the radar in 2015, I think, when the coup happened in, or the failed coup happened in Istanbul. Since then, there's no trace of this person anymore on the internet, uh, no email. So I, I haven't visited the project since, so I doubt that the project went on as it was planned, sadly enough. So a very small conclusion, I think cooperation with local authorities is necessary to, to, take, to take the discussion and, and the, the, the preservation of, of the heritage first and foremost forward, that is very important. And I think embracing heritage is, a first small but necessary step in a much longer and bigger process. Uh, and I hope that you all agree that these monuments deserve the proper protection they need. Uh, because by the time I was working there, as the area was becoming more and more touristically exploited, now, how would I say, because of the Syrian civil war, that was about to change. So the Turkish decided to exploited. I was there for my work. I saw a lot of treasure hunters going there, trying to f go on these sites, trying to find medieval coins whatsoever um, and take them home. Now, I don't know what the impact of the Syrian war will be towards the stability of the, of the area, which might have the only good effect might be that treasure hunters are scanned off and are not, uh, not as much at the moment. Uh, uh, are best for the area, um, but they were in abundance when I was when I was there. Uh, I did some discoveries myself. I went to the local museum of Adana with them. They looked at me and they said, "We have we have no place for this," and they took me towards their uh, uh, separate building at the back and they said, "You can lay it here." Luckily, I've, I, as a, as a proper archaeologist, I, I mapped everything, identified when I found everything. But I have, I, I plan in the next trip to visit the museum again and hope to find all of that still there. But I cannot tell you more about that right now. So that brings me towards the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you for your long attention. Uh, this long monologue, which is already a bit different. Normally, when I give my presentations, I do it physically, and then it's a bit more easier to have interaction with the audience. But I hope you enjoyed it all. You can find my book uh, at the website of Brel. If you have questions, you can ask them now, or you can always contact me privately as well. Thank you very much. Excellent, Driesel. Thank you very much indeed uh, for a fascinating um, presentation. Um, if you'd like to stop sharing your yep. screen so we can see the audience um, and uh, we'll take some questions and comments. So in fact, we have one question already um, come through on the chat line um, from uh, Ferdus in Taj. Would you like to ask your question, Ferdus? Hi, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I'm a big history fan. I've never been to Turkey. So 
in one point of your presentation, you said like after 1198, uh, there was a king, like it was a kingdom, Armenia. And, and you said like the kingdom flourished for the next century. So what was the relationship pattern change from before 1198 and after 1198 between among the uh, Armenia and uh, like Ottomans, Crusaders, Arabs, how did they change? And in one of one time in your presentation, you said like it has some history may correlate with the Game of Thrones scripts. So does it have any relationship with the term Khaleesi or like the Khaleesi tribes in the Game of Thrones? Thank you. Um, just so I've got the question right. So the question is, um, what was the uh, significance with the two periods? What happened in the period after 1198? Why did it manage to flourish after that period? Is that right? Is that your question, Fadush? Yeah, that's one question. It means like, did the relations, I, I assume the flourish said like the flourish after 1198 when they had a first king. So did this also change their uh, relationship characteristics with the uh, Crusaders, Ottomans, Mamluks, Arabs. So how did this relationship uh, criteria change? Okay, well, um, it was a lot of, of course, circumstantial factors as you, um, so in the beginning of the 12th century, the Byzantine power still was had his eye fixed on, on, on Cilicia because they had it as a province, so they really, it's, they, they tried every attempt, every so many years they would do a campaign in trying to uh, annex it again towards in their empire. Towards the end of the 12th century, these attempts like start to stop. And at the same time, you see that the Rubenids clan is expanding their territory. And they also try to make a, a good relation, like you say as well, and that's true, with the principality of Antioch. And because of these relations, indeed, because of the pressure going a little bit less from the West and a good relation with their neighbors in the South, they managed to grow stronger and stronger and to get themselves in a position diplomatically where they can ask the Holy Roman Emperor for, their, for his support. And the minute that happened, you are in a, in a complete different geopolitical ballgame because suddenly the Byzantine Emperor is not really de dealing with this Armenian baron but he is uh, he's dealing with the Holy Roman Empire emperor. So as a Byzantine emperor, that it's a different uh, ball game. And he, at the time, he, they also have different uh, difficulties that they are been threatened with. So um, I think that was the start. Then the combination of having internal I would just say rest, like the Hetemids were not, they were, they had to see that the Rubenid clan was stronger. So internally there was, there was no struggle. That meant that they could actually uh, uh, put all their efforts into the building of the castles, like I told you, to make the, the frontiers a little bit secure, add in the help of the military orders on the on the frontiers, that all helped a little bit to actually put the the, the pressures, which which were also less than than a hundred years before. Um, it was only when actually the Mamluks suddenly start to come on the on the uh, in the area that that ball game changes again because. The, the amount of, of soldiers that we're then talking, then you suddenly are, are a strong minority. They managed to survive due to their fortifications, but at the end they couldn't they couldn't compete against such a, a force so much bigger than themselves. Does that give a bit of an uh, explanation? I, there was also a second question, but I can you explain? Like the, that's funny question. Like you told about like the his, history may correlate with the Game of Thrones history. Like does it have any relation? The, sorry, I, I cannot uh, understand. You like the Khaleesi, like the history of the like uh, Game of Thrones has 
may have some connection with your history of the like, Armenian Empire? The history have... of, the, of the toponyms? The, the, no, game, the Game of Thrones, is there any uh, connection of the, oh. uh, the castles with the castle in uh, Game of Thrones? Kalesi? Uh, no. <laughs> Sad <laughs> <to> say no. <laughs> no. I would like to add another question. Uh, like, what was the religion's percentage uh, like in Armenia at that time? Like, Orthodox Christians, Catholics, uh, Muslims? Jewish, what, what, are, what are the percentages? One of the, the major uh, rifts, of course, is like there was an attempt to try to unify the, the Byzantine Orthodox with the Armenian Church at the beginning of the, at the end of the 11th century, beginning of the 12th century, but that failed. Uh, uh, those two in the area present, you've got uh, in the Cilician plain, when the Armenians arrived, there must have been uh, Arabs living there, so Muslims. And then you've got the passage of the, uh, of the Crusades, who might have brought the Western Christian influence over there as well, with some uh, Westerners who stayed there as well. So you've got yourself a, a true melting pot of different cultures, different religions. Um, throughout sources, I have to say, the, there's not much mention of, of struggle between them. Uh, the only thing that you can see is that the Armenian royal court, very soon after the foundation, mirrored itself towards a Western court, like I would say Frankish court, uh, in the name of officials using like marshal, taking marshals, and, uh, taking the same kind of uh, military appointments. So they, they did take that over. But religion wise, there must have been a true melting pot at the time. And the first king was Arthurus Christian? Yeah. Um, any Thank other you. questions or comments from the audience? Um, if not, I have one, uh, Dweezil, if I may. Um, would you, is it fair to say that you could distinguish between almost two classes of castle? You know, the estate castle and if you like the more strategic regional ones and does that reflect how the kingdom was organized in terms of small baronetcies with their you know, estate castles uh, and my follow-up question is yeah who paid for the, the yeah. big strategic ones absolutely uh, very question and um, there are even and uh, when I did my, in my research, I tried to actually make, made a, a bit more uh, differences. So you've got watch posts, which are really, really very small structures who are located very strategically on a pass, who could have not have served really as an administration center, but was merely one objective only, control the pass that you're located on. Then, of course, you've got like... Um, estate homes, estate houses, fortified estate houses, like I showed you a few of, they could have served, they would have served mainly um, an administrative function, like to house a, a small uh, lord, a small baron, um, occasionally with, maybe with his, with his retinue, depending how big that was. Uh, but then you, what clearly was, you had like a bit more garrison fort, that was located a little bit more on the frontier area, like in the in the Taurus Mountains, in the Amanus uh, mountain range. That is not really yet a fortress as it may, because this, of, of the scale, must have hold, uh, held uh, just for the purpose military of a garrison to control. And then you've got, of course, the big fortifications, the big fortresses, the big seats of the, the most important uh, two families that they held. The resources for that, may it be the material resources to actually find, you know, there are limestone quarries abundant in the area, but still the resources that the logistics to bring uh, all these, uh, this material on these sites, that must have cost a, a huge amount. Um, what I haven't mentioned, which must have paid a little bit of an, uh, which was a help financially for uh, 
uh, the Armenian king and the bigger barons is the trade deals they made with the West. So the Venetians, uh, the Genoese had all very early on trade deals with the Armenians. Uh, and it, for the Armenians, that must have been quite lucrative to, to have these Italian merchants in this kingdom because they had to pay the rights to use the river, to get themselves the houses. So that must have been a source of income. The lands were very fertile, the Cilician Plain, which I was talking about. So that must have helped as well. Um, but the amount of manpower it must have uh, demanded, that also requires, that is why I keep going back to that period of 1200, 1300. That is the only period where it was internally and, and externally peaceful enough to get such a big wave of construction building on its way. Your sound, uh, Quinton. The, um, the Crusades or Crusaders, when they came through, did they pay or did they force their way through? Ha, very, it's a very interesting um, because you, so the Crusaders arrive at the start uh, at the Cilician Gates in one group. And it was uh, Baldwin who said, I'm going to travel the shortest way to the Holy Land. I'm going to travel through Cilicia. While the others say, actually, uh, they're also, because the, the plane was, there were uh, Arab garrisons in the plane. And the others didn't actually trust the journey. So they the way around the Cilician uh, gates to go all the way around. Uh, towards then Mamistra and then that way going towards Antioch. So it was only a limited amount of the army that went through. And uh, there was a little bit of confusion at the time because they see these Western armies approaching. There was mentioning in the sort, but then we have to, uh, well, rely on what sources tell us of this period. Uh, and that is, as you know, is not always, uh, well, we always need to be quite critical towards that. But uh, it says that they now and then to bribe the garrisons to go out, to surrender. Um, but it is a fact that, that actually the Normans took control over the three biggest cities in the plain while they passed. Whether it was forced, whether it was with, due to battle, that I, I put that in the middle. But it was quite clear that there was no organized defense uh, trying to stop them. That was actually the first real stop was then in Antioch, where you had the major uh, fortifications defending the city. The cities of Tarsus, Adana, Mamistra, while they were classical and quite important, symbol sim symbolic symbolically, they didn't have that military uh, strong reputation at the time. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, um, if not, uh, um, I think we should wrap up and um, I'd just like to say thank you very much again for a fascinating talk and, and really, you know, some remarkable research uh, building up such a collection, a collective knowledge of the castles in Cilicia. And I, I come back to your last point in the hope that it is recognised almost as a collect, collection of architecture, collection of castles of, um, you know, national and, and indeed global importance. Um, so I hope uh, that your efforts continue, that others recognize the value of your research um, and uh, that you know, the sites are preserved and the knowledge is preserved. So thank you very much. Many thanks, many thanks Quentin and many thanks Craig as well for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. Thank you everyone and uh, good evening.